I'm Carolyn Forche, and I'm a trustee of the Griffin Poetry Prizes in Canada. With me today is Victoria Chang, whose book Obit is shortlisted for the Griffin International Prize in Poetry this year. Welcome, Victoria, and warmest congratulations. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Um, I'm fascinated by this book and formally and in terms of its subject matter, which is so uh, very moving, compelling, poignant. In finding a form beyond elegy, beyond the traditional elegy, uh, a, it's a sparer, more clinical form. It seems that you were able to explore the many losses that accompany a death. Would you like to say something about the form, first of all, and how you arrived at it? And what did it allow you to do? How did it help you to generate uh, in such a, um, a sweeping, wonderful way, a mm -hmm. contemplation of loss? Um, first of all, thank you. That was a, a very nice um, and a generous uh, statement about about the book. And, and I think that, that for me, um, all the traditional elegies that other people have written and that are very varied, you know, there's not sort of one monolithic elegy um, that comes to mind, just they, they're all wonderful. And I couldn't really imagine myself replicating those in, they're just, you know, to me, th those kinds of poems, um, you know, like Whitman's poems and in some of the pastoral elegies, they're all they're all perfect, and I I can't do that. It didn't feel like my experience. My experience of grief felt more like a, a field, you know, versus. And that's not to say that theirs didn't feel like a field, but mine, like more literally, formally felt like um, it, it felt very widespread and uh, scattered. And so, I think that um, you know I was avoiding the elegy, and then I also think in terms of content. Like I was, I've thought about this a lot kind of since the book has come out um, because people have asked me some questions about it. And I think you're, you're right. I mean, the starkness of, of my experiences and sort of the anti-celebratory, um, the anti-sentimental maybe even and the philosophical more elements of, of my personality probably, but also my experience as, um, a Chinese American, Taiwanese American person, I think factors into all of these things that I've been talking about. And and uh, I think that, you know, the form kind of came as I was writing. And I think I, I first started, um, and I just wrote, did a talk about this yesterday. So it's fresh in my mind. I started with a, a poem about, or fragments about a bee. Mm -hmm. And so the bees, that poem was the first one. And I was just playing around and I think I just kept on going and going and, you know, it was over a short period of time in two weeks. And so um, they just were sort of fragments and long lines sort of things. And eventually they made it onto the computer and had that sort of rectangular coffin like shape. So it was very much uh, an act of, of play and process, which I think is very much so how I like to write anyway. So it, it, yeah, it came along the way. This book begins with a interestingly, with the death of your father's frontal lobe from a stroke. And then the next obit is the death of language. It moves through the deaths of your mother, yourself, voicemail, the future, civility, the death of your mother's lungs, the death of privacy. There's so many things, objects, states of mind, gestures. Um, that expand out from the originary loss of, of the loved one um, to even contemplate what dies within the self when, um, when someone you love dies, the things that will no longer exist because of that. Um, so what did you discover about the capacity of language to articulate grief? Or is there anything you'd like to say about the discoveries you made along the way um, through your really highly original, and it's something I really haven't seen before, um, uh, articulating the realization of how much uh, abandons us when someone dies, how much mm -hmm. is no, no longer going to be the case. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think um, my, you know, my mother was ill for so long. And and so that's partly what I think shaped this kind of book. And then my father was ill for about the same time and, and is still around. And, 
and so I think the combination of the, that those accumulations, um, you know, kind of gave me this experience to, to that I I sort of documented over over time, um, and I and I but I I think you know even if your parents die quickly. It, it, you still feel all these accumulations too. It's just that mine were just spread out a little bit. They're elongated. And I think that's what um, the book kind of stemmed from. And in terms of language, I mean, I think, I mean, you used the word um, when we were talking earlier, or pris prism, you know, like this, I think of, of it as a prism or a crystal, you know, something that can refract a lot of different lights and things like that at different times of day and turn different colors and, uh, and I and I do think of of this book as being like that. I mean, it also feels kind of like me trying and trying and trying and failing and trying and failing to use language to articulate these unbelievably, as I'm sure you know um, and have experienced many times over the the, ex the experience of of grief. And I think looking back on it, I was curious to see and challenged by the idea and the notion of whether language can even um, articulate those emotions. And I think that when I, you know, I finish and I think, oh, maybe, maybe not, but it can get close. So maybe we're like an inch from it. Language can get, you know, uh, a fraction, maybe like a centimeter, a millimeter, depending on who you are and, you know, how you feel. But I don't think it can ultimately. And I think that's why we write poetry <laughs> period so yeah you have a line in this book the grieving speak a different language mm -hmm. you say other things about grief that are really interesting grief is really about future absence and then you say sadness is plural but grief is singular mm -hmm. and so i think you're circling the ineffable all through these obituaries but in between them we have the tanka which mm -hmm. is like a haiku, only it adds two lines, two more seven syllable lines. So it's a five line rather than a three line form. And these tankas are about, I think they're about children and about parenting. How are they in conversation with the obits? Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes tell this story, but it was actually Ilya Kaminsky, who you both know, um, who um, kind of was thinking about Tonkas and and saying, oh, these are about children, kind of thing, and and uh, and and so I think that I felt like they are directly in conversation with these obituaries because they um, they were, you know, children. I was trying to, and I say this in the book, trying to raise them them while helping people die at the same time, and so there's a constant moving back and forth between death and, and life and hope and um, hopelessness. And so the polar aspects of that were, were always on a, on a minute by minute, second by second basis, sometimes in the same you know, space. It's like you go into one room and help turn on a, you know, some kid with technology so they can be occupied. And then, then you go immediately into the next room and my mother can't breathe and has to, um, be helped take something off and and it's so it's just it's like within an hour of visiting or two hours you're just like and it just can be really mm -hmm. overwhelming and I think the tankas um are in the book to sort of in the end mimic that um experience but also to give the reader a little bit of a a, a break you know I think that giving um the 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 reader a break from those stark mm -hmm. coffin like obituaries yeah. they like, modulate yeah. the, the mm -hmm. tone and the intensities i think very well and how did virginia wolf help you to write this i understand <laughs> that you would open virginia wolf uh for inspiration that you chose words how did that work yeah so i mean i think of virginia wolf's the waves as like a word dictionary for me during this process and so um you know, I think that that I just I love that book. It's it's just been such a like a companion for some reason throughout my life, and and I think that uh, it's just such beautiful lyrical, airy, cloud-like yeah. writing, unlike anything else. And so um, 
I just thought it was fun. Just, you know, I like to mess around and play. And, and so I just um, would have it as a, like a little dictionary. And if I found some phrases in there, or like pots, I know pots of jam, which is just so archaic and beautiful. And so I know that pots of jam, I just remember loving that phrase. It's like, I'm going to see if I can use pots of jam in a poem. And it was just a way to get the mind out of the mind and let language sort of direct the poem versus me being a director. So it was just another sort of fun thing to do. So her, her you know, even if they're just like, you know, cloth or something like that, words that mean nothing, you know, I might as well open a dictionary, but I thought Virginia Woolf is better than a dictionary. So um, <laughs> that I used Virginia Woolf throughout the book. And so her words are a part of that ghostly aspect of this book too. And there's a kinship and a connection that way, I think. Well, it all comes together beautifully. And I want to warmly congratulate you for being on the short list. And I look forward to your readings and to the awards. And thank, thank you for thank being you. with us today Thanks. in Canada and abroad. Thank, thank you. you, Victoria. Thanks for having me.